Hello viewers, welcome to my YouTube channel. In this uh, study, I'll be looking at poetry and the poem in question here is by one Emily Dickinson from Massachusetts, a state in the U US and a town called Amherst. Emily Dickinson lived between the year 1830 to 1886, around 56 years. So the poem that we will try to interpret is entitled Because I Could Not Stop for Death. This poem is very important and it's quite interesting based on its subject and the way Emily Dickinson builds that subject and uh, the kind of comparison that is there is one that is out of this world. First, let me take us through the poem and the poem begins because I could not stop for death. He kindly stopped for me. The courage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste. And I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at races in the rain. We passed the fields of gazing grey. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews grew quivering and chill, for only Gozaba my gown, my tippet on the tube. We passed before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible. The corners in the ground. Since then, it is centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day. I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. So this poem by Emily Dickinson deals with marriage and love. And it deals with it in a kind of subtle way because it compares marriage and love to a voyage or a journey of death. So marriage should be this joyful thing that makes people to be glad. But then when it's compared to death, which is quite the opposite, then we are left uh, surprised. So the first stanza, in the first line, it begins, because I could not stop for death. So it suggests that the female speaker, a kind of uh, shows some feminine passivity. When we go to line two, he kindly stopped for me. So we realize that this death is a kind of hypothetical man a kind of uh, a man who has uh, called on the lady who has wooed her, who has seduced her, maybe into marriage. And uh, the third line of that stanza, the courage held but just ourselves and immortality, it kind of suggests 
the authority that the man wields and uh, then again in the first line it is implied that the female here must have been living some independent life then all of a sudden the the gentleman caller gets into uh, her life and the immortality that accompanies them in the carriage suggests that maybe as long as they are alive, in life and in death, she has quite surrendered her soul. She has surrendered her everything to the service of the man. And that is what continues in uh, stanza two. They drive slowly. The man knew or knows no haste. And what I've just explained in stanza one is reiterated here that the female states that she has had to put away all her labor as well as leisure for man's civility. In as much as the man here is being compared to death, it is quite ironical that he, again, is made to look civil at the same time he's made to look uh, kind. And that still lays credence to the fact that the man really wields a lot of authority over the woman in a marriage setup. In stanza three, the carriage, the carriage of their married life, their courtship, they pass the school where children strive at recess in the rain. They also pass the fields gazing grain. The grains are, you know, gazing at her and the woman here realizes that she has truly surrendered her agency and volition. And that one also comes out uh, in the fact that even the setting sun has passed them. And uh, then in stanza four, the woman in her bridal linen, you know, we may not be so familiar with uh, the words Gosama, uh, Taipet, Tune, but they suggest uh, the bridal linen that the female must have put on during this marriage. So, in as much as she has this bridal uh, linen, uh, there seems to be a suggestion of her mortal chill to her life. So it is sort of a bridal death, yeah, uh, a, a sort of a death in life that the woman here is surrendering her life uh, to. Then stanza uh, five, we passed before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. So the image, the imagery that comes out here is that image of a grave. So the bridal house where the female is being taken to is kind of a grave. And uh, it reiterates what I've just talked about, that the woman having surrendered her independence and having had to remain loyal to the husband or the bridegroom, she kind of enters into a bridal house that is seen as a grave, a bridal grave. And then lastly, in the last stanza, the point 
The persona says that since then, it is centuries and yet feels shorter than the day. I first surmised the horse's heads were toward eternity. But since the day that she assented to this marriage, it has been so long a time. And uh, that is also captured in another poem of Emily Dickinson's in a statement uh, that miles and miles with not or with nothing. So it's kind of when this woman enters into marriage, then she feels that it is a century of death in life. And then a kind of a dream deferred that at first, when she accepted, when she accepted the love of the men here, she thought that the voyage or the journey was towards heaven, or towards eternity, that things were going to, she, she was going to be this Alice in the Wonderland, and things were going to work all for her. But that's quite the opposite of what has happened to her. So, viewers, that is uh, my interpretation of Emily Dickinson's wonderful poem because I could not stop for that. I don't know what you think. You can leave your comments at the comment section. Again, you can give our video thumbs up if you like it. If you are new here, kindly consider hitting the subscribe button so that anytime we produce a video like this, YouTube will automatically notify you. Thanks for watching.